This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. When prehistoric humans made their first tools out of sticks, they probably hit someone over the head with one first. Similarly, shortly after we discovered nuclear power, we made a bomb before we ever even figured out how to harness its power for things like power plants, RTGs that power spacecraft, and so on. It's hard not to be misanthropic when talking about nuclear weapons. Not that it requires any effort for me normally. Anyway, enough about all that. This is about a keyboard and a trackball. Several years ago, uh, me and a friend of mine, well then colleague, were at work browsing eBay and we come across this keyboard and trackball. We thought it looked awesome and it had some interesting buttons on it. So we actually decided to get a pair of them. When it finally arrived and we started uh, doing research into what exactly it is uh, we had and uh, tried to find uh, anything we could about the keyboard online, we couldn't find anything uh, at all. It wasn't until a week later or so uh, he messages me and he's like, I found it, I found it, found out what the keyboard is. He sends me a picture of a nuclear missile silo uh, command center and sure enough, there smack in the middle is uh, our keyboard and trackball. <laughs> um, so yeah, that started the whole road into trying to figure out how this thing works to see if we could uh, get it to function. This year I brought the keyboard and trackball to the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest and uh, made a poster using some of the images found on the Nuclear Companion website. They have a really awesome site uh, that features pictures of this uh, keyboard in its context inside of the console where it would have been and then where that console would have been in the bunker. So that's really neat. You should check out their website. There's a lot of background information there too on what system this new system replaced, etc. Um, really should check it out. I'll put a link in the description. So two things of note here on the plaque in the back um, is uh, one is that it says type OID, which uh, thanks to the Nuclear Companion website we now know stands for Operator Input Device. I couldn't just call it keyboard. And then uh, secondly, uh, you can see the uh, serial number says uh, 007, which we thought was amusing. Anyway, I'm unscrewing the uh, interface here that I've uh, made to uh, interface with the keyboard. I'll talk more about that later. And to open the thing, uh, you know, it, it's basically a metal lid that is secured on both ends with two screws and then you can kind of wedge a screwdriver in there and pop it open. Uh, as you can see it's all uh, reed switches. It's a HAL effect keyboard or a reed switch keyboard or whatever you want to call it. Um, so let's have a look at the board here. The first thing you'll see is this Intel MD82510-B chip which is their serial controller. Pretty standard stuff. Then a lot of these other uh, smaller chips you see in a line there are pretty much all RS422 uh, chips, drivers. And then here covered by the tape you've got the micro. Uh, it's an Intel uh, 8051 family uh, microcontroller. Uh, the MCS51 family um, and I've got it covered by a, some pieces of tape uh, to avoid UV exposure. Alright then closing it back up here because I wanted to take a look at the trackball and the whole reason for this is that during uh, VCF the uh, Y axis stopped working on the trackball and I think I know why. Probably the piece of uh, foam tape that I uh, put in there 
as a repair probably came loose because um, this had like foam type uh, friction stuff on there that completely disintegrated uh, over the years so I had to replace that and uh, I found this uh, felt pad uh, type of stuff that is used for um, I guess uh, insulating window edges and stuff like that I used that to um, basically fix the to, to replace the old uh, the old stuff that's gone this thing is a uh, has uh, two screws on each side so eight screws total um, it's really bolted down <laughs> but other than that it pulls out just the way the, the, the keyboard does and then um, if any of you have ever opened a ball mouse before this will look very familiar um, because basically um, it's got some rotary uh, optical encoders in there to detect the X and Y axis movements. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple mechanism. And then sure enough, as you can see, and as suspected, the uh, pad there came off of the one roller, uh, which is why, you know, movement in that axis stopped working. Uh, so I was contemplating here whether I could salvage it and push it back in there, but then eventually I decided to just rip it out and uh, put on a new piece of foam tape. And I used the length of the old uh, piece of uh, tape as a guide for the new piece. And I was cutting with the dullest uh, knife. I'm just uh, sort of pre-shaping the piece of tape uh, over my socket driver here so that I don't have to struggle with it too much because it will want to spring up uh, once I put it on there. And here we are putting it on the little spindle thing. trying to carefully making sure it's aligned and removing the protective uh, layer from the tape as I go so that it doesn't stick to itself. But yeah, that's, that's sort of the process and then once you've got it on there, um, you have to make sure that there's no bumps or you're going to feel that. So I cut off the end, and then I uh, go over it with the Dremel for a little bit to make sure it's absolutely smooth. So um, yeah, so here, just sort of like letting it spin along with the Dremel, not really putting a lot of force on it, just you know to smooth out the seam, uh, and that really seems to help a lot. And also make sure it's all nice and round. And then we're putting it back together. Putting in all the screws. And a lot of screws there are. And yeah. And I guess we'll try and see if it works. So yeah. Uh, reverse engineering this thing took some doing. I was basically first trying to figure out like you know measuring where the ground is and sort of looking at the chips that were on board. Um, we were su surprised to learn that it was RS-422 not 232. So uh, 422 basically gives you an inverted signal. Um, oh here I am testing whether it was uh, successful and it was. <laughs> And here I am putting uh, the whole thing back together again. Anyway, yeah, RS-422 gives you the inverted signal on one line and the normal signal on the other line. Uh, it cancels noise that way and allows you to go further distances than regular serial. Um, but yeah, that, that took a little bit of uh, figuring out. Um, 
and then was basically just attaching the whole thing to an oscilloscope and trying each pin to see where we saw data, where we saw the inverted data, and then sort of go from there. Uh, first, you know, like bit banging, trying to figure out what data is what, trying to look for patterns, and then eventually wrote some Arduino code that can actually read the keys. And here that's what it looks like in the dark. You can see that all of those extra keys there have uh, an LED that lights up. Um, and the extra holes there on the left are for uh, key covers, uh, which you can see in the uh, uh, on the Nuclear Companion website in the pictures, there's key covers on, on top of those keys. Unfortunately, we don't have the covers. Um, that would have been cool if we did, but no. And there's this one special key, the bit key, which seems to re sort of reset the keyboard. If, if I press that one, you'll see all of the little lights turn off. I don't know what the original intention was. Oh, here's the programmer for the microcontroller, uh, the Intel microcontroller. Uh, took some doing to find something that would program stuff this old, but we found one from this company called the Dromeda Research. Um, and their software looks like this. Uh, <laughs> it's a DOS program that, that you use to to edit um, the contents of the ROM. Uh, thankfully, there are emulators and stuff uh, available. Uh, but eventually, you know, all of that reverse engineering led to m me creating this little interface, which has the Arduino Micro, which can emulate a mouse and a keyboard, and then the other chip on there is the RS-422 driver. This is like an early version. I had to put a botch wire on there because uh, initially I wanted to add, uh, try and be able to power the keyboard from the Arduino power, but it turns out that uh, it, it pulls way too much power for that, and it end up frying the Arduino. <laughs> but yeah. And then here we are actually testing uh, the keyboard and making sure the mouse moves in all both directions, which it did. Well, mouse, I mean trackball. Um, and you can see how um, there's basically three uh, RS-422 devices. Well, four maybe. Um, that each send a different address. The regular keys send one uh, thing, the special keys send another, the mouse keys send another, and then the mouse movement send another uh, byte as first uh, byte, which is the device address, presumably, followed by the actual data, um, which may be variable in width. Um, you get one byte for most of the keys, but you get two bytes for the mouse data. Uh, Obviously, one for X and one for Y movement. Um, anyway, it's usable. Here you can see some uh, gopher browsing. There's the baby using the keyword. The up key does not send a. Was it up or down? The down key does not send a key code. Um, I think maybe the, the little read switch for down is broken on this keyboard or something. I don't know. I, I, you can't visually see something, but. Um, I'll have to check it out one of these days, um, but you can get around it by using J and K. Uh, other than that, everything else works. Um, the only downside is that the uh, modifier keys, Alt and Control, don't send key codes, uh, which is unfortunate because that pretty much, you know, makes it so it's very hard to use as a normal daily driver keyboard. And that's because the modifier keys are handled by the keyboard itself internally. Uh, for instance, like when you shift some key, it'll, it'll send a, a different key code rather than just sending a bit flag. Um, when you do alt or control some key, it doesn't send anything at all, uh, which is unfortunate. But yeah, that is what it is, I guess. In any event, I hope you liked my nuclear nuclear keyboard video. I'll probably do a follow-up video where we uh, 
make uh, the version 2 of the uh, interface um, and where I address some of the issues with the first version. Um, so that will be, be up next. Um, and then I'll end it here uh, with some footage from the video that is uh, to be found on the Nuclear Companion website. Uh, cut some clips out where you see the keyboard in action in its natural environment. <laughs> All right, see you next Target time. Target it on its uh, directed objectives, and then the launch sequence begins. Okay, I'm on the missile launch checklist on 3-98. Three. Step one, launch key inserted, previously accomplished. Great. Step two, targeting or launch option selected. Select from the launch main menu. Launch. Click A option selected. 0051. 0051. Okay, step five, alignment mode. Enter Mike. Mike. Step five, Alpha. Enter Sierra in the PSYOP BOA field. Sierra. Step six, initiate key pressed. Initiate. Entered. Juliet, Papa, Papa, November, Kilo, Foxtrot. I have Juliet, Papa, Papa, November, Kilo, Foxtrot. That's good. Enable switch. Down and lock. Down and lock. OID, over to whiskey side. Whiskey. Step six, initiate key pressed. Initiate. Successful enable co op. I agree. All call enable is accomplished. Moving back to launch checklist. Agreed. Step 18 and launch actions at this time. Hands on keys. On my mark. Three, two, one. Mark. Hold. I have ELC message transmit. And release. ELC message transmit. I agree.